new symposium of a global award of sustainable architecture. <clears throat> uh, it's now more than 15 years that uh, this award takes place in Cité de l'Architecture, so it's a great pleasure. <clears throat> the suspense is not so important because uh, we organized in June during the Biennale of Architecture in Venice um, an event to publish the names of uh, architects and uh, personalities awarded by this prize but you will have uh, the pleasure and uh, interest to listen all our uh, <clears throat> architects now and it's a pleasure for several reasons at first, because uh, Cité de l'Architecture has now reorganized its uh, programs around three main topics. <clears throat> Naturally, we are in a culture minister uh, topic upon art and architecture or architecture and art. We will have, for example, uh, next year a, a great exhibition on Paul Andreu, Architecture et un art. Uh, next year, the beginning of uh, uh, 24. A topic on architecture and social questions, very important. Uh, it's an evidence for everybody here, I think, uh, for with uh, the, uh, the many, many topics as uh, uh, the rural uh, area, uh, the transformation of uh, the existing architecture, <clears throat> the growing of the metropoles, etc. And we'll have at the autumn a great exhibition upon uh, Le Grand Paris Express, Great Paris. This is the whole uh, district of uh, Paris outside of the walls and the new metro, the new tube, who will irrigate, uh, will deserve uh, all this area how the transportation is a factor of creating a new town <clears throat> and last but not least naturally the, cli the climate uh, transition the climate transformation and <clears throat> this award takes place naturally in that uh, perspective and uh, it's a pleasure also to announce that uh, next year we will have a new position uh, in Cité de l'Architecture to organize special programs on that field. So, <clears throat> um, I don't want to be any more long, and I think the, the main interest for you is to listen uh, to the, the architects that have been distinct by this prize, and put that perhaps uh, just before, I will uh, um, first uh, give all my thanks naturally to Yana Rivedin, who is the great uh, organizer, the, the great, la grande prêtresse, pourrait-on dire en, anglais, en français, de ce prix, uh, but also to the staff who worked hard for this prize, and they are in front of me. You don't see them, but I see them, so I would like to to uh, thanks uh, Christine Carboni, the Deputy di Director of the uh, uh, Department of uh, Architecture Creation, and all his staff, uh, Manon, uh, Mathias, and, sorry, could you say, uh, well, thanks uh, a lot, because uh, I know it was a hard uh, work, and Unfortunately, uh, alas, we were obliged to uh, transform this symposium in an online event <clears throat> because of uh, uh, what we could call a French uh, competition that is strike, you know, it's a, it's a national sport in, in France, uh, but uh, I wish uh, this won't uh, uh, deserve it, and uh, I wish you a very good afternoon. Perhaps, Yana, you, do you want to, s to say a few words or? 
With pleasure, Catherine, but I will just do a closure of the whole symposium where we will see the five laureates of this year. The theme uh, that I have been giving was architecture is experimentation. And this was a very, very, um, very um, attractive team. Apparently, we had so many nominations as never before in 18 years of the life of this award. So enjoy uh, Mette Ramsgaard and the two wonderful architects and philosophers of RAF uh, from the Netherlands and Xu Tian from China, Simon Tessou from France and Benedetta Taliebue from Spain. Uh, it is, will be Marie-Hélène Cantal who was leading this award for the whole lifetime since 2006 to do your introduction. And for all of you, the laureates, you will have the publication of your book next spring presented in Venice. So I'm looking forward to your very short this time because we are online, but very intensive presentations. I'm looking forward and the floor, Marilene, is yours. Okay, thank you, Jana. So it will be my turn now, my honor and my turn to present shortly every lecture of the one of the Global Award winners of this year. And the first one, the first lecture, will be uh, the lecture of Mette Ramsgaard Thompson from Copenhagen. Mette Ramsgaard, architect, founder and director of the CETA Laboratory Center for in Information Technology and Architecture in the Royal Danish Academy of Copenhagen. When the Global Award was given in 1999, uh, I remember one of the winners was Thomas Herzog, a world-renowned expert in solar architecture, dear Mette, an inventor. He dedicated this prize to an expression of ang anger. He said, where are our laboratories, we architects? 15 years after, at the time when the ecological crisis is forcing the entire construction line to innovate, where are the laboratories of, for architect architectural research in public research budget? Where are the architects in the industry laboratories? All too often, research into building and its future sees architects more as consumers than contributors. Architect Mette Ramsgaard Thompson is widening the bridge opened by architects like Thomas Herzog, Philip Samin, Werner Zorbeck, and so all architects, inventors, patent filers. In 26, she founded the Center for Information Technology and Architecture in Copenhagen as a place to explore both what architecture can become if technologically informed and what architecture can contribute to scientific and technical research through its critical and creative tradition. CITA's work began with a study of classical materials, steel, wood, textile, plastic, and so on, with the aim of advancing their computer modeling, the knowledge on their properties, and their digital fabrication. Today, CITA is exploring living organic material, like those biopolymers, able to metabolize and to transform matters to produce light, to produce energy. Mette is a student of Peter Cook. She will tell us what she is discovering about this living material, which resists and sustain differently, which adapt to the climate, to the climate, sorry, by modifying themselves. As for she expects from the material of the 21th century, it's very simple, a permanent axiom of architecture. Dear Mette, I, I quote you. Our work seeks by relying on the origin and properties of the material, simply freedom in design. So dear Mette, the screen is yours. Thank you so very, very much. Let me just get my 
screen sharing up here. Um, I believe you should see the front. Am I right? I hope it's all good. I am. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm laughing a little bit because um, I see this great effort that you are all doing to speak English. Et moi, j'ai préparé mon discours en français parce que je voulais faire le même effort pour uh, essayer d'être uh, dans le contexte. But I have a feeling that um, that it is the correct language here will be to be speak in English. Can I just be confirmed in this? Wow. Yes. I will. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I will give another discourse in French. I've been preparing <laughs> for another time. But first of all, I want to say um, how very pleased and honored uh, that we are in CETA to receive this prize. Um, I'm really, really sad to not come to Paris. I look very much forward to it. And I feel that when we meet physically, we become friends. When we meet virtually, we become associates. So I hope very much that we can find another time where we will be able to be in the same space. I look very much forward to seeing the presentations of um, my co-prize um, people. Uh, and, uh, and I hope very much we find a moment to be in the same space. So um, I have, so I just need to find my there. Um, in CETA, we are extremely proud uh, to receive this prize. We're especially happy that it happens under the theme of experimentation. It is really the absolutely center core of our uh, practice and our work over the last 15 years. Um, CETA is a group of researchers that work together uh, to uh, discover how architecture can change once we work fundamentally and engage deeply with digital technologies. Um, over the last 15 years, we've been looking at different ways of working with digital architecture, digital fabrication, and new materials. The project Radicant, that is the project that's been nominated for this uh, uh, prize or that has been looked at for this prize, is an experiment that looks at how architecture could change if we worked with biological or bio-based materials. Okay. I'm just having some mouse problems, so I'm trying to find my, okay, I use this one, yeah. Over the last five years, CETA has been working, uh, turning our attention to bio-based materials as a way of understanding what sustainability could be, both as a way to think about how could the materials of architecture change, how could we work for a, a net zero architecture, but also more conceptually to widen our gaze and think about what happens when we stop thinking of us and nature as a dichotomy, but rather think of ourselves as being participating and part of the ecology through which resource is uh, arriving. So working on the biological side of the butterfly diagram, if we look to circular design, is to try to think about how do we participate through practices of harvesting, of practices of growing, practices of nurturing, how do we participate in the built environment, in the making of that resource and, the, and the, that our uh, architecture itself self becomes part of much larger circles of ecological and environmental change. This is of course a broader idea. We see a lot of, um, IT understood as a way of thinking about optimized, optimizing material systems, using advanced simulation to think about um, different ways of describing Optima. But what we're trying to do here is really to consider a much more networked relationship between self environment and the built space as part of these circles. So accepting that we are in a limited planet in which our resources take part in a closed system is to really fundamentally challenge what industrial production has been giving to us. I just need, I need to find my mom here. Yes, Sarah. 
Ah, you are not seeing my slides change, no, I see. I'm sorry, yes, we don't see your slides. Oh, so sorry. Okay, let me try to share screen again. I don't know how that happened. Sorry, let me find it. Would this work? Do you see now? Okay, we got it. Yeah. Yes, right. okay. okay, thank you. So anyway, I will go through the slides a little bit faster here to just, so this is who we are in CETA, our practice in CETA, and this is the project Radicant in which we're trying to look at these biological systems and how architecture can more profoundly be part of these systems of return that biomass um, suggests to us. So what I'm trying to get at is that architecture is described by a new set of sensibilities and that our task here in an age of sustainability is to find out how to activate those sensibilities and how to create an architectural ideation that is allowed to connect back to the resources that we work with. So rather than thinking of materials as something abstract that is delivered to us with no consequence except for cost and maybe a delivery uh, schedule, then how can we think of the, an, a design practice that is aware of the resources it use and the impacts on the ecologies and natures that they are part of. So coming back to this point of a, a limited planet, if we try to think ourselves as connected to the idea of a closed system, then how is it that architecture can return, be parts of systems of return? In our experiments, what we are trying to do is to develop new practices for resource thinking, for its conceptualization and analysis and its fabrication, to be able to connect different data streams across the ecological, the designerly, the analytic, and the fabrication-wise, to be able to connect back to understand how resource is impacted. In Radicant, what we are doing is we're trying to work with bio-based materials that um, develop new principles of circularity. These materials are made of local materials, polymers such as collagen, fibers such as bark, um, wood flower, cotton, seagrass. Um, they are brought together in different proportions and different ways that allow us to create a class of versatile materials in which materials can be constantly substituted. We look at how we can understand their characterization, how we can understand their principles of fabrication, how we can understand the composition and the design strategies that allow us to understand by what we are, mat we are materializing architecture, how we're distributing material and how we're deploying different resources, both at the scale of the overall, also at the scale of the single element and down to the scale of the actual um, uh, uh, print path. What is at stake here is the idea of a new understanding of the behaviors and the performances of the material, understanding how they're changing over time and how they are have different kinds of strength ratios than the technical materials that we are um, used to in architecture, such as fossil fuel based plastics and fiberglass. This material has another logic. It has the logic of the recipe. It's also made with technologies that seem very cooking like. Here, of course, more high tech ways of weighing material, mixing material, and in the end, 3D printing material. What, is it, what is arrived at is a material versatility that allows us to vary the material 
not necessarily only in respect to an optimum, as we have been thinking about during modernity and the 20th century, but also in respect to what is locally available and what is the source that is abundant. We are interested in how these materials can be steered or maybe tuned in respect to an idea of resource availability. And what is perhaps the most important part of them is that they're always part of, they're always part of the biomass that they are part of, meaning that they're always engaged in processes of um, reconstruction, returning to the earth that they come from. We are interested in how these processes are structured, interested in monitoring their, the durability and their change in environment. We are survey the different uh, shape changes that are happening, the swelling, the fusing, and the cracking. We develop models by which we can understand and characterize these material changes to be able to understand how the materials operate in time. And not only to understand a sense of um, faiblesse, a failure, but rather to understand them, to try to um, work against the idea of architecture as something that has a fait accompli, it's something that just finishes the day the architects hands over the building, and instead propose a new kind of architecture that is continually constructed, continually mended, continually repaired, as a much wider practice of building as, as an action that is durable. We're inspired by these materials and the way that they interact with local species, all to try to understand how the materials can become part of an architectural performance. So to return to this idea of sensitivity, what we're trying to examine here is really how we as architects can understand materials as they change and as they become and as they unbecome as part of an architectural cycle. These particular materials that I'm showcasing here are not new. They've been used for centuries across many different building cultures. What's interesting is that they have been forgotten during industrialization where fossil fuel uh, based equivalents were much easier to control and to characterize. What I think is the opportunity here is that with our tools of computation, with our tools of machine learning, of data-driven monitoring, of being able to time -based data, create time-based databases, we're able to create much more complex models of characterization that could maybe open new attitudes to be able to work with these materials. So this experimentation is not singular in CETA. In CETA, we work across both technical and the biological. We try to understand how to model materials in high detail. We're interested in integrating the craft space and the digital the steered to create new hybrids that lie across this otherwise quite dichotic understanding of what is low tech and what is high tech. What we lean to is an idea about thinking what materials can be, also working with living materials that can change and that operate within the time zone, not of just duration, but also of life. What we want to do is to ask what could our, the relationship be between where we live and where the, the, our living is annexed into these ecological niches that are the places in which we are. So again, just to repeat, of course, we are extremely honored and extremely thankful for this prize. It means a lot to be recognized for what we think is the core of our practice. And it is very um, honored to be in such fine uh, company uh, with this prize being given to so many um, uh, peers over these many years. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Mette. Thank you for this inspiring lecture. Yes, and welcome in the Global Award community, <laughs> of course, yes. So.
No, I wish to introduce the next lecture from Ronald and Eric Riedveld, uh, founder, founder of the experimental studio HAF in Amsterdam. Just a few words to explain. The Global Award for Sustainable Architecture has already included uh, engineers, sociologists, mathematicians, or landscape architect. Today, with uh, Ronald and Eric, he is being presented an architect artist and a philosopher, brothers, founder so of his half studio. What do they do? They call special intervention the artifacts they create and they produce into inhabited space in order to question it. In particular, they used those artifacts to question the great historical infrastructure by which mankind always wanted to control the territory or the nature. They do so to question this heritage, the meaning of this heritage in the past and in the future. The Bunker 599 intervention, for example, focused on, on one of the 700 structure of the new Dutch waterline, a very long military defense dike built from the 19th century. From this huge military infrastructure, Utrecht and other cities, areas of Netherlands, could have been defended, but it was by flooding all the lowlands of the country. A line of defense, by the way, as willingly indestructible than potentially destructive. The studio half, <coughs> the studio half will show us how it turned. No, uh, I must explain that no, this waterline uh, is, um, is, a, in, is an historical monument of Netherlands. Of course, it's important. And no, you, you will see how half turned this contemporary soothing perception of this so lethal waterline that would, that would have flooded the country had the state given the order. Other RAF works have similarly questioned other structure that had, been, that, uh, that had been conceived indestructibly defensive or controlling the nature in the Netherlands, in the world. They work all the world. They work in Cappadocia, in Vienna. They are artists and performers in the white space. Some of them intervention re reveal now, by example, that climate change renders this huge system useless. Most of them encourage all of us to reflect on our material, social, and technological environment. This artistic think and do tank is also for us, that's why this Global Award an experimental architecture practice. Why? At first, because Raf's intervention influenced public action. The bunker has influenced the Dutch monument policy, by example. Secondly, the most important, and maybe it's my point of view, maybe Raf will not agree with me. I think that interventional Raf give maybe to architecture the symbolic place that statuary had in the symbolic role of illustrating our collective narrative. Until the last century, remember, the urban statuary, the stairs, the, the mausoleum, the memorials were sufficient to condense collective memory in the cities, in the landscape, in the villages, but nowadays, this statuary is no longer enough, is no longer on the scale of our emotion, no doubt since the Second World War. In Berlin, Peter Eisenman Shoah Memorial, an entire urban space has brought about this change. The founder of RAF intervened to provoke this larger questioning of history because they have understood that architectures today 
is scaled for must take on this role of activating consciousness. Dear Raf Studio, the screen is yours, and I hope you agree. <laughs> Thank you for this uh, kind introduction, and uh, yeah. I Thanks think, a lot. Yeah, we actually don't have to give the lecture anymore. <laughs> no, it's very, it was really good. Thanks. Um, uh, Eric is at another location, so I'm in the studio uh, in Amsterdam, and uh, I will uh, uh, start with the presentation. Eric, you can uh, you can of course add if you uh, miss something. Uh, I'm at a, at a place where they're doing a demolition outside that was not scheduled. Uh, so uh, okay. I'm happy that I can uh, put my sound off in the drone and can do the PowerPoint. Okay, now that sounds good. I'm going to share my screen uh, and then I start with the uh, uh, presentation. Yes. Okay. Um, is it visible for everybody? Yes, yes. okay. This okay. is a bunker. That's, Thank that's you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Thank you. Now, you already gave the introduction to Bunker 599. I will come back to that uh, uh, soon. First of all, RAV is an experimental studio and we make art-based explorations. So um, it's, uh, of course, I have a background in uh, uh, architecture and uh, architecture is necessary to make what we do. It's in, uh, really important, but um, uh, often it uh, is about art commissions and architecture and art blend, visual art blend together in the projects, together with philosophy, because Eric is a philosopher uh, at the University of Amsterdam and Socrates professor in uh, Twente in the Netherlands. And uh, together we run the studio. I'm an uh, artist architect. And we work with young talents um, and uh, not for a, a day, a week, a month, but for many years. We uh, bring them in the studio and over time they grow and start themselves uh, uh, their own practice afterwards. For example, Anna Makic, uh, the lady um, standing in the black and white picture, has now her own practice, very well-known uh, architect in the Netherlands, who speeches all around Europe. Um, so a group of young talent uh, around us. And if we make projects, we expand. So the studio is very small, but we expand uh, with, a, with a group of people even to 30 people, but we always go back to a small core, uh, a small team. Bunker 599 was made together with uh, uh, Atelier, Atelier de Lyon. And it was uh, my initiative in 2008, I think, to uh, do something in the new Dutch borderline because Eric and I grew up in the area you just introduced. The new Dutch borderline was a waterline running through the middle of the Netherlands. I will go one slide further to protect uh, the west side of the Netherlands, Holland, known as Holland. The whole country is called the Netherlands and Holland was the, the rich part which should be protected. And we did this by uh, flooding area areas uh, to avoid Germans to enter the Netherlands. Um, so what we wanted to do is actually, this is in the low part of the Netherlands, the blue part you see, the blue, green and blue part is actually the part below zero. So many works of RAF uh, are uh, taking place in this part if we make projects in the Netherlands. And this is really in the middle. And we thought there are so many objects uh, in the new Dutch waterline that are not seen and not, uh, um, it's about a historical structure, but you should also reveal its meaning in, uh, in its contemporary context. And we wanted to do one intervention that opens up a new persp perspective on the 700 bunkers in a new Dutch waterline. These bunkers are spread over uh, the country, as I said, uh, structure of 80 kilometers long, and they um, yeah, appear like this in the landscape. And what we wanted to do is to cut to at a strategic point along a highway to through one bunker. And uh, we did a proposal. RAF makes its own projects. There are no often no commissioners that give us a call and say, uh, can you do this for me? We initiate this works ourselves. We want to cut through this seemingly indestructible structure, this object of war. And through 
a monument because it was a municipal monument. And we said, if you want to bring this idea of this uh, meaning to a contemporary context, um, we should cut through it once. And if we cut through one, that you reveal also the interior of the 700, 700 other bunkers. So we did this uh, and it took five years to cut through policy, but it took just a month to cut to concrete. So once we got all the uh, money, uh, we could do it, but to convince all, all monument parties took a long time. After we have been cutting through the bunker, uh, it was be uh, it has become a national monument within a year. And uh, two years ago, it has been listed as UNESCO World Heritage as part of the new Dutch waterline. So the things you see in the work of Raaf are equally important to, uh, to the things you don't see. You see a cut through a seemingly indestructible, indestructible object, the bunker but you don't see that we have been cutting through this monument, which is equally important to the work of Raaf. Space. All, many of our work is about taking stuff away from the planet rather than adding too much. So uh, making space by taking away stuff, a world which is filled, uh, which is filled with uh, stuff and images to create a poetry of absence. And also, as I already said, theoretically, Eric uh, is also involved as a philosopher. We pre produce also papers. Hardcore heritage is a kind of thinking on, uh, it's about imagination for preservation. This was a publication in Frontiers of Psychology. So the work uh, reads much far further than just the professions of uh, visual art and architecture. And it also influences, as you already said in the introduction, policies. Uh, in this case, uh, the Agency for Cultural Heritage of the Netherlands. They use this as a reference, uh, as another way of thinking about heritage. Another way of thinking is not only about heritage. I just sh sh show a couple of projects to illustrate our way of thinking. We were also asked to make the Office of the Future by the Chief Government Architect of the Netherlands. Rather than making a building, we were interested in uh, what does it actually mean uh, to work in an office and to be with your to be with your body in space. We discovered that actually sitting, as I'm doing myself right now, because all the uh, objects, the testing objects, uh, we used to have like these models, to actively standing are now gone at the moment. But we were researching. Um, uh, how can you uh, 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 let your legs work during the day? Because that's where it, about, where it is about, if you talk about sustainability in the working environment, everybody is thinking about the building. Nobody thinks about the body, the body in space. And therefore it's necessary to put pressure on your legs during the day. And that's how we made the end of sitting installation. Then an, uh, an, um, uh, an important note, affordances is uh, uh, in the work of Eric a very important notion. And it's also influencing the way we work. So the possibilities for action provided by the environment. We don't think in objects, in stairs or in chairs or in, uh, in uh, tables if we want to uh, renew the working environment, but we think in the terms of affordances, the possibilities for action. So we started with taking away all uh, um, uh, chairs and tables. And what does it mean if you want to keep pressure on your legs uh, during the day in different positions? How can we work in different positions uh, to keep your body actively um, during the day? So we did, and we do this in many different ways. We are making mock-ups constantly, one-to-one, -to -one, to testing things one-to-one -one on your body. In the end, this was uh, the the uh, this already introduces different uh, working positions, and uh, we integrated this all these testing uh, models in one giant landscape, a new working landscape that used to be also a uh, place for observation observation for scientists, movement scientists who have been observing how people working and compared it to a uh, normal working environment. Conclusion is that people are more actively, the guy on the left hand side seems to 
uh, uh, sit, but he's standing actually. All these new working positions are uh, represented in this landscape for different lengths of different bodies. And you will find your place and switch over time during the day because it starts to get uncomfortable. And that's exactly what needs to happen in the working in environment. If you want to be actively uh, working during the day. So you should move from position to be active. What works for the lady in the front with the long hair on this spot doesn't work three meters ahead. So it's not about the design of the landscape uh, as an aesthetic thing, but it's based on working positions. And uh, again, papers are published by movement scientists afterwards. So you, again, you see that the work is much more than an object for architecture or visual art, but reaches quite far. Um, the uh, idea is to have an openness to uh, radically different practices. So we are not going to design another chair. There has been designed a million chairs already in history, but we are creating a complete new landscape. We are not going to preserve heritage, but we want to uh, 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 introduce a completely new vision on heritage that you sometimes have to cut through a monument to reveal its meaning. We also showed many people uh, probably uh, saw this one, also at the Venice installation, we showed the potential of space in the Netherlands. Everybody said the Netherlands is a densely populated country, but there is a lot of public and governmental heritage empty for five years. So, or more even, and nothing is happening in between. Also the Dutch pavilion, the French pavilion, the English pavilion is vacant for a long period. The Dutch Pavilion was already vacant for 39 years because the biennial is just a couple of months or half a year. And the rest of the year, there was nothing. It's a wasteland in Venice. So we wanted to reveal that uh, the potential of empty space in the Netherlands, also in Venice, because the Dutch Pavilion is on Dutch soil, soil like the French Pavilion is on French soil, Spanish on Spanish soil, um, that in the Netherlands, there uh, is a lot of vacancy. We wanted to represent that there in the pavilion that has been standing vacant for 39 years. So we left uh, a pavilion completely empty. Most of the visitors first thought, oh, there, there are conceptual uh, Dutch again. But when you went up to, uh, uh, the stairs, you saw a sea of vacancy representing 50,000 years of public and governmental vacancy in the Netherlands, small country. And uh, we made a Dutch atlas of vacancy, so huge atlas, uh, to show that it's not about uh, a blue foam. No, it's about real buildings with real locations, with real sites, with real potential. So we wanted to reveal the potential of all these buildings rather than filling them with new uh, uh, program. Again, a new uh, uh, um, uh, paper was published, which is really important. Uh, in the research for Eric, a rich landscape of affordances. So also in the Dutch Atlas of Vacancy, we showed the affordances of vacancy uh, yeah, to the world. That's what we wanted to review. Um, Delta Werk slash less, the last project I'm going to show is again below sea level in the blue part, uh, blue gray uh, part of the Netherlands or blue green part. And um, it's a, a, a unique place in the world that also uh, uh, tells something about uh, a living in a country below sea level. This is the storm surge barrier, also sometimes called the eighth uh, world wonder. Uh, the massive uh, dam that is, has been constructed in, uh, in uh, the Netherlands, in the Delta. And everybody knows this and, uh, in the Netherlands. And outside also uh, a lot of people know about it, of course, but um, what is really well known is, of course, this, this, this works made below sea level, but less known is the experimental uh, uh, playground, you could say, there's an enormous forest, there is a little boat on the, on the foreground in the water, then you see the scale of this forest. In this forest, there are all, uh, um, all it's an open uh, laboratory, a hydrodynamic laboratory, laboratory where they tested all the Delta works. And it's a unique place 
where people uh, made complete rivers scale one to ten, uh, one to ten, or one to twenty. They constructed it by hand. Seventy-five engineers after the Great Flood in 1953 in the Netherlands. Um, uh, 75 engineers worked constantly on testing all types of delta works. How can we deal with uh, shipping, uh, um, ships in rivers, and also giant water structures? Later on, even uh, foreign uh, groups came here, and we also made, uh, uh, for example, uh, the port of Lagos, the harbor of Lagos, the president of Nigeria, the, uh, Nigeria with the president of the Netherlands, foreign de uh, delegations were invited to come here to see how uh, uh, Delta works could be made also in other countries. Most important is in this, in the, in this uh, country below sea level, we wanted to build an indestructible Holland. And therefore we even made uh, giant testing installations. For example, this is uh, a uh, wave generator, uh, which generated waves of three meters high. And um, meanwhile, we know that indestructible Holland is uh, not something um, uh, that is for sure. Absolutely not. The power of water we have been, we have seen seen it the last uh, decade in an extreme way again. So we questioned on this spot in uh, this for uh, the, in, at this um, giant water uh, model is an indestructible Holland. Uh, is that uh, possible in the future. We think it will be a tough uh, thing to uh, keep going on like we do uh, uh, in the Netherlands, to use the toughest structures to keep the sea outside. It's um, with sea level rising uh, almost a mission impossible on the term of uh, 100 to 200 years. The wave generator, see this human on the right hand side on top, then you have a little bit of an idea about scale of uh, the wave stay. Uh, made in this uh, testing object. This is just one of the 40 testing objects in the forest, but the largest one. And we got a phone call, and that's how often projects start. There is no commission once again. Also for the end of sitting, no commission. We generated it ourselves. So we don't do tenders, no competitions, nothing. We generate our work ourselves. And we fail a lot, but sometimes we succeed. In this case, we got a phone call to do something with this old wave generator, which is 250 meters long, so enormous object. And um, it's in the forest of all these old testing models, which has become runes. And we always start investigating with every project in history. And we discovered that this uh, whole structure has been built on the ground level. And we thought we can also take away this ground. This is 1978 and uh, make a structure that reveals actually, or uh, show the vulnerability of living below sea level. So we take away all, we took away all ground around it. There was six meters of ground laying against the walls and um, put this whole structure itself into water, cut pieces out of the walls and turn them 90 degrees. So we wanted to show this, testing delta work, you could, you could call it, the vulnerability of living below sea level. That's what it uh, does. We blasted the complete uh, concrete structure open by uh, sandblasting to also introduce space for new forms of life. I will come back to that soon. All types of uh, 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 use are happening over there. People are swimming there. Um, and it has become a national monument as well as part of the Waterloo Bos, the whole area. And uh, as I said, it also introduced space for new forms of life, biodiversity, moss. Uh, um, uh, yeah, you could say moss specialists were involved to create to uh, create a new substrate for all kinds of mosses. And that's what I'm going to show. I'm almost at the last slide of my presentation. But the transformation is now taking place over time. It will become a completely different structure taking over by mosses ferns, and it's already going on right now. So even when it has been raining, it becomes already completely green, and you see it's going to be taken over this massive structure. Um, yeah, over time, it will transform into something else. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you. Thank you, really, for this, for this very impressive project. And may I add that we, we are expecting a lot of you in the future <laughs> for your next project, please. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I will now shortly, as, as usual, present the next lecture of your Chinese friend of uh, Beijing, Xu Tiantian. Xu Tiantian founded DNA Design and Architecture Beijing in 24. It was in 2014, on the, on the occasion of uh, commission in the, the rural county of Songyang in China, that she decided to dedicate her work to the redevelopment of rural areas. Xu Tiantian belongs to the generation that experienced really China's massive urbanization. The flood of peasants to the cities has devitalized and impoverished the countryside. Not the least was to destroy China's agrarian and social texture. In 2014, when the young Xu Tiantian, she's always young, when the young Xu Tiantian discovered Songyang, 700 kilometers southwest of Beijing, the rural areas were called in China the forgotten country. But as Xu Tiantian will explain us, this rural world still today represents half of China and the destruction of its economy is a real threat for the food security of the entire country. Xu Tiantian in the Songyang region aimed to reverse this trend, to not abandon the rural world, but by no depending of the government investment and of, their, uh, of the usual vision of rural modernization. This aim to respond to the needs of local people without the help of the state has led her to experiment which approaches still little used in China. She calls architectural acupuncture an approach that minimizes intervention, relies on community and plays the card of a, of a specific self-development rather than standard policies. The amazing project that Xu Tiantian will show us are not architectural dreams, may I add. Each of them is a result of this approach, which is both sensitive, working on the people's attachment to the village, to the history, and holistic, co-programming, -program, co co-designing, co-building with human and material resources, sustaining through each other the agriculture production, the architectural resource, and the social life. In other, in other words, situated experimental project and a patient self-development result more than a big government plan. They are more robust, more sustainable, and most of all, most accepted by people. After 10 years of project, some of them carried out pro bono by Su Tiantian, she can be proud. In the village, this project, a cover bridge, that is also a market, a workshop, a tofu factory, have sparked off others. Business have been created. Young people have returned from the cities. I quote Su Tiantian. Just as acupuncture stimulates blood circulation, we have stimulated social, economic, and ecological circulation in rural Songyang country. Dear Xu Tiantian, you have the words. Thank you, Mahi Evans. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and I also want to thank the award for um, the global award for this great honor but at the same time it's also an opportunity to contemplate um so let me start with um sharing my screen first um 
So first of all, this is a global sustainability award. And the thing this year is um, architecture is experimentation. So um, in the beginning, I thought, wow, this is interesting because they look almost contradictory. But then I think again, this is actually, it's interesting that this really is the reflection of how architecture, architectural engagement in a rural context, you know, architecture is um, actually becomes the uh, uh, a um, social intervention and social experimentation. So I start with this Songyan story, the um, project that we collaborated with uh, um, local community, village communities and local, local authorities for um, over eight years since the beginning of 2014. And, uh, and this is a, a process that uh, we realize that um, the architectural engagement in the rural is not just by making um, the, the the process of making buildings, but rather it's really to integrate with the um, local history context um, and 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 tradition heritage, and most importantly the the uh, the local community and to provide a systematic and sustainable solution for the rural issues. So in this way, we, we um, adapted this method called um, architecture acupuncture. It's a way of introducing small cultural public programs into each village context, but really tailored according to its own context. Um, at the same time, this is a, um, a, a, a remedy to um, restore the village rural identity and to serve for the community and, and the village collective, and also to bring in new potentials, social, cultural, economic potentials for each um, village. So in general, it's a, actually a mapping system and to uh, promote, to, to, to reactivate the circulation uh, within this county region. For example, you can start with uh, looking into the cultural uh, context of this Hakka village. Um, the the, uh, the program of a Hakka indenture museum is also the opportunity to restore local long lost masonry building techniques, at the same time pro provide a um, open space, leisure space, especially a summer pavilion for the local um, villagers and also both the, the, the visitors. And um, we also look at into um, abandoned infrastructure in, in the rural region. And this, for example, the, the abandoned uh, Shimon Bridge, um, um, instead of uh, uh, demolish this unsafe structure, we proposed to uh, preserve it by adding a new canopy um, in the in a, in a form really reflecting the, the 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 rhythm of the bridge structure, but at the same time it becomes a, a collective space, a common space, for villagers across the rivers, but also for um, visitors um, and and for the for the regional uh, communities and to accommodate different activities. So a simple structure like this, actually you can also relate with, with, with the, um, the traditional um, bridge, lounge bridge. So there's a context. Um, and at the same time, the lounge, uh, the common space um, provided by the bridge also becomes an important community meeting space. So in a way, working in a rural context, you're looking into different uh, possibilities, but also, and it's always related with the tradition and heritage, um, but with a purpose to bring a better uh, future for the local community. And of course, we also look at into the natural resource, for example, this bamboo theater, you know, bamboo has very strong uh, root systems, so it works as a foundation. And the construction process was very simple to work with the villagers. Um, and we, 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 we built this by weaving um, you know, within a, a, about a week of time. So this is the shortest construction time for us, but it instantly create an open space in the nature and um, also a, a, a bamboo theater to, um, you, you know, to, for the local opera performance. 
And this is also, we see it as organic architecture, a metabolic uh, architecture um, and in, the, in this bamboo forest. And again, it's also uh, it's a philosophical thinking from the ancient China that um, to build up this uh, harmony between human and nature. Uh, this is the uh, painting from Ming Dynasty, already indicating a you know, space um, in the nature with the bamboo. Um, of course, when you're working in the rural, you cannot forget about the agriculture. So agricultural pr production has become very um critical elements, uh, essential elements to look into the village heritage, tradition, and also the way to um, look into the economic potential. For example, this village is um, best known for the um, brown sugar production. So a new uh, brown sugar factory is built um, to, to reunite, to integrate all the existing family workshops uh, basically, they were working in their um, family kitchen, and at the same time, this can also upgrade the production quality to increase the product uh, price. So the traditional way of producing this um, uh, product, for example, like brown sugar, is already a striking performance, and we take this factory, you know, that the the space, the production space automatically becomes a sense of a, a stage, a theatrical um, sensation to introduce to audience, to open up and to uh, increase the um, um, visitors, the, the amount of the visitors and circulation in this area. And it also runs 24 hours. So this kind of a, um, production as performance, um, really attracted um, many uh, visitors to the region um, in the winter production season. And this factory is also functioning as a live museum to showcase the traditional heritage, but at the same time also functioning as a uh, village community space, cultural space um, for different uh, cultural programs and community activities. And uh, just within the few years, the price has already increased, and many of the farmers started to plant back the uh, sugarcane plantation. So it, this change of the landscape we, uh, around the village is definitely by this, it's not by landscape design, but rather by this uh, social design process. And of course, the, 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 the increase of income also bring more revenue to the village. So this also happens, you know, each basically each village has has a certain agricultural production that that is famous in the region or um and or or, or the communities are really proud of. Um and the tofu factory in the in the mountain village uh, at the entrance of the, the village also um is a collective um operation by the uh, reunion or reintegration of the family. Um, households, the family workshops um, as the shareholders. So they're not just the employees, but they're really, the, they have the, the ownership of this collective factory. So it's really gener generating a new type of a collective economic structure um, in different village uh, communities. And uh, like the brown sugar production, this is also open up a possibility for a performance or a live museum to attract visitors, but introduce in the uh, different in the in the in the chapters or, or episodes based on the sequence of different production, um, and the visitors can it's it's open to the visitors for educational for for cultural um, purpose, but also can uh, provide a meeting space for both the um, visitors and local villagers. So in all of these projects, um, this intention to introduce a um, light maintenance. Um, it, 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 well, the, the, of, of course, the project that the building is operated by the villager union, but at the same time, light maintenance um, can uh, can be more sustainable in the in the rural context. So in a way, the sustainability in the in, in rural context is always about the integration of uh, social, cultural, um, um, economic, and ecological um, aspects. 
Um, and in the in the past years, we have seen really seen the young people returning to this region. Um, I think over eight thousand people by now return to the region, and many of them, you know, uh, in in a younger age. Uh, 30 to, to, to 40, um, under 50 years age, and, and initiating this uh, new businesses, uh, startups in the, in the region with their experience um, when, from the cities. Um, and also at the same time, you also, we also realized that in the rural um, area, um, the, the architectural engagement is not about the making of buildings of, of new architectures, but really carefully to look into very specific local resource. Um, and for example, for in, in this um, neighbor county, Qingyun County, uh, where it has over 3,000 of abandoned quarries, we, we started to look into quarry as the unusual, but also specific local resource. Um, so the county has, of course, a, a, a over a thousand years of history uh, with quarry uh, a, a heritage. And around around the 2000, um, um, most of the quarries were, were uh, closed down because of the safety and ecological challenges so, and left with um, many of these small caves uh, because the, this quarry was used to be operated by family workshops like the um, like many other um, agricultural counties. So quarry, I mean, this space were considered as the product or leftover from an abandoned industry production. But we we also see there's a potential with this quarry, um, very very unique uh, local um, resource that that is able to um, actually um, the, to have the, the to have the new uh, potential with adaptive reuse but also a way to restore the local collective memory um, so we were working with the local authorities and the village communities especially the local quarry workers into this and by providing this very um, practical planning proposal to the local government um, by saying that these quarries are um, definitely have potentials and they, they can, by introducing a new program based on each quarry's identity, you know, you know qualities, um, there would be, they could be converted into cultural uh, programs, social leisure program, and also with this area in their under planning for new, to introduce new buildings. Uh, for cultural programs. So maybe the reuse of the quarries can reduce the, um, the amount of new constructions, um, therefore can also reduce the climate, you know, the environmental impact um, by construction. So actually this, this is also a very careful um, engineering process with the geotechnical structures uh, to look carefully with the safety reinforcement of these abandoned quarries, also with minimal intervention approach by introducing only the needed, the, the, the necessary um, enforcement, reinforcement of safety uh, for, the, for the structure. And at the same time, the adaptive reuse um, of these different quarries is also based by different by each quarry's own characteristics and uh, um at this, so in, in a way it's also acupunctural um uh, with the minimal intervention and for example the first one is uh reconverted it and into a live um stage for um it's by the request of our quarry workers um to provide a stage um after over 20 years this is a a they have their own stage again to perform their um, technique and heritage, you know, this quarrying technique that actually most of them have been working with the quarry for um, the most of their lives. And it's very intense work, but that, that's also very strong um, memory and, and sentimental um, attachment to this um, heritage. Um, and also the, the the adjacent quarry could be converted into a um, a, a quarry a, a space 
to connect with the as a quiet space, but also could, uh, could be converted into a uh, performance space for the younger villagers, um, with this local young women uh, from, from the adjacent villages, or uh, as a traditional um, theater for um, traditional um, opera performance. And the design intervention, again, is um, minimal only to um, preserve the original um, char characteristics of each quarry with a, um, a, a proper new program. And at the same time, all these uh, uh, quarries are, are open public uh, cultural space, community space um, for, the, for, the, uh, for both visitors and the villagers. And the construction of these quarries are taking um, much less time. Uh, three quarries are done within six months and with the, the in, in, in overall budget less than one making one uh, new cultural building. So in a way, it's also a very economic um, uh, strategy for the local uh, authorities, also for the local communities to restore, revive these abandoned quarries. So there's also the potential with the rest 3,000 quarries uh, altogether. So and 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 also the last quarry is a, a um, also the adjacent one, but has a more um, a, a sequence of uh, entry and then a a, a larger um, interior in 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 a quarry in the cave. And this is dedicated to the local and cultural and calligraphy heritage by preserving original geometry, topography, the interior topography, and introducing just a very um, uh, soft membrane surface uh, for activities, uh, for passages, and for the reading terraces. Then this is what we call it the book mountain, and only um, uh, with the, uh, the very um, subtle and, and minimal um, uh, introduction of a new walkway, new passage. But then the whole quarry is presented as a monumental space um, dedicated to our um, quarry workers and to the local quarry um, heritage. So we see these quarry spaces are not only um, um, you know, with the design intervention, this is a uh, um, the, the, these abandoned um, quarries or local waste um, resource can can be turned into somehow uh, from negative to positive to be valuable um, resource. But at the same time, it's also to restore the collective memory for the local um, thousands of years of uh, uh, quarrying um, tradition and heritage, especially for the for the older quarry workers, that these spectacular spaces are really handmade by these quarry workers spending their lifetime um, decades by decades working and generation by generation working in this very it used to be very harsh environment and now these could become somehow spectacular um, monumental space um, that's really and also a, a, a welcoming open and welcoming community space um, that was um, this is really to to restore the the collective memory and also the pride and honor of these um, villages. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Tian Tian. That was an amazing project. And same thing, we we do ex expect in the global community, we do expect a lot of you in the future, of course. Thank you. It's my turn now to present Simon Tessou, French architect, founder of the Atelier de Rouget in France, the workshop, the Rouget workshop, with some words. Simon Tessou's position, which is still singular in France, makes him a trailblazer for a new vision of the architect's role. I will explain it by a little history of France. French architect of the last century, I have to explain, had to deal with massive urbanization, like in China, more or less, uh, not the same scale, but it was pretty hard. So had to deal with, we had to deal with a massive urbanization and architect had to build very quickly, under pressure, entire city, thousands, hundreds, thousands 
and thousand, hundred thousand of homes as fast as possible. The best of them, then, Paul Dubuisson, Fernand Pouillon, Paul Chemetov, French architect, wanted to rise to this challenge of large numbers. They say to the government, architect can face this challenge of quantity without compromising on quality. But unfortunately, this ethical challenge was lost. Their vision was defeated by a very mediocre industrialization of construction, as in many other countries, by the way. Today, which architect still believes in making the world better through the quantity of projects you will be able to build. This affects the new generation, who has a feeling of not responding enough to the needs. Simon Tessou paradigm shift is this. Building less today does not, doesn't mean res resignation. Building less allows us to develop different, a different ethics of quality, an ethics of, qu of care at first and foremost. The micro project, so he says, that Simon Tessou deals with opens the way to a micro treatment of the f to the things that make a place better and above all, an ethics of exemplarity. It's no longer the time to make an example out of quantity. It's better now to carry out situated projects that are experimental, to refine processes, to give them an aesthetic so that those processes can be disseminated, taken, taken up by other architects on other situated programs. In this, Simon Tessou joins other Global Award winners. Let us think of Francis Kerré, by example. When Francis is criticized in his own country, Burkina Faso, for building too little, for building too few, he simply replies, when I built one school, I built it well, because I built it to educate to a better architecture for schools. Like him, Simon Tessou chose this site. This architect, a disciple of Kenneth Frampton, who lived in the United States, settled in Auvergne, a very rural region. But you have to know that rurality was not less abused in France than the French city during the blooming of reconstruction. L'Atelier de Rouget, which he founded, brings quality back to these rural areas, not through radical projects, but through precisely located projects, projects agreed by the communities, projects that built on each other, treat their subject with care, that <coughs> brings, excuse me, brings their subject with care, and each of one brings their peace to an inhabited environment, to a society that wants to develop collectively and harmoniously. Simon Tessou, Urban's micro project, earned this year the Grand Prix d'Urbanisme in France, great prize of planning in France. It's a nice year for Simon Tessou. For, the, for those very little projects. It's by a way a paradox, but it's a, it is a very happy paradox because it means he is setting, like Francis Kerry, an example. So, dear Sim Simon, dear Simon, I give you the words and my place. Thank you very much. Um, I said the, uh, okay, everything's ready. 
Um, I, I would like to, to thank uh, the jury for for my nomination to the, the Global Award for Sustainable Architecture. This prize means a lot for me, uh, and it's a great honor to be part of the Global Award uh, community. And I warmly uh, greet the other winners. Um, and I, I met some of them in Venice a few months ago. Um, I started my practice um, in a remote place in a small village of the called Le Rouget in France, um, in the Auvergne region, southwest of the Massif Central. Uh, the Le, Le Rouget is located on the dividing line between um, the Dordogne watershed to the north and the Lot watershed to the south. You can see on this uh, on this plan, on this map. Um, those two two main rivers uh, that finish into the Garonne and eventually in the Atlantic uh, Ocean. But you can also see the, the Cantal volcano system um, uh, on top of the, um, the picture. Um, hope you see the, the pictures. Is every, everything okay with the... Imo, we don't see your picture. You do not see the picture? Yes, now again. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so this region suffered a massive uh, rural exodus from the end of the 19th century. Um, the, the state has largely uh, subsidized the planting of conifers and um, pastures, formerly occupied by the livestock farms. And that started after the Second World War. You can see on this map all the new forest um, in red. Um, the, the other forests are represented into, with the pink color. Uh, those traditional forests are hardwood. Um, and as my agency grew, um, um, I bought um, a free plot of land in the middle of the village of Le Rouget uh, to to build to have my workshop there and three homes, including mine. Um, so to build uh, the, the, that small um, building, um, we made a clearing cut in a family forest to build the office and the appointments. Uh, the wood you can see here on those two pictures are Douglas fir uh, that were planted in the 60s. And in, in doing so, um, the architecture of the building expresses new paradigms, um, which with a significant reduction in the carbon footprint of construction. At this point, um, I must explain that the traditional buildings of the village uh, were constructed in constructed in stone and granite, uh, mostly and hardwood. And after the Second World War, of course, uh, all the quarries uh, closed, uh, and cement blocks or concrete replaced uh, stone uh, and uh, uh, wooden uh, windows, for example, were which is replaced by plastic windows. So I'm going to show you a few pictures of the of the workshop um, that show how framework, um, interior joinery and furniture characterizes um, the architecture. Um, that's the the, the ground floor of the the office. Uh, the previous picture was the uh, the top floor of the agency. Um, but the fact is, um, the sun is also uh, and its course is also an important resource uh, for the project. Um, the Rouget is situated is located at an altitude of uh, six hundred and fifty. Uh, meters and it can be quite cool at night, including in the summer. Um, it can obviously be very cold also in, in winter time. Um, uh, but on the other hand, the region has a significant uh, amount of sun 
um, which with which uh, with which you can really uh, design architecture. Uh, this is why the project uh, uh, strives to uh, capture solar energy to return it indoors by phase shift. Um, the large shutters you can see on this picture um, allow, of course, us to control solar gain. So we can uh, shut the shutters, all the left shutters are articulated together, all the left ones uh, are also articulated, of course. So you can shut um, the, the whole facade if you wish, uh, according to uh, solar gain. Um, you can see on this um, two diagrams, one section and one plan, uh, the, the proportion uh, between wood and concrete. Um, of course, we also need concrete in wooden structures for inertia and also to um, uh, help all the structural um, systems of the uh, of the building. Um, <clears throat> and of course, the architecture also gives rise to uh, intermediate spaces where the pleasure of uh, uh, living is expressed. You can see here the double height space in front of the studio um, and the loggia that is suspended to the wooden structure um, uh, that faces my uh, uh, apartment. Those two uh, um, pictures show uh, the quality of light uh, at the winter solstice. The sun um, enters the depths of inhabited spaces and in summer, direct solar radiation does not enter. Um, but those pictures show also something that I, um, I try to develop in, into my architecture, is the idea that the relation to exterior is not like a sort of a, you know, a traditional window in a, a thick wall or modern horizontal um, uh, window into a, a thin wall. Uh, it's rather sort of a, um, the fabrication of a ecotone between interior and exterior, uh, very thick, it's sort of a lay, different layers that um, uh, come from um, the exterior towards the interior. The, this project was the starting point of a series of uh, other buildings which explore the possibilities um, offered by the articulation of filigree uh, wooden structures promoting local resources as I showed on the uh, earlier map uh, showing all the uh, wood resource that is you can you can use to, to build nowadays um, and uh, the the relation also to concrete or earthworks uh, that are combined with the um, wooden uh, structures. Those diagrams uh, here are only plans that show the proportional relationship between wood and concrete or earth sometimes. Um, and of course, the, the goal uh, is to improve the carbon footprint in, of construction. The first building um, is a cultural and associative center in the Rouget, my village. Again, it uh, shows a combination between um, laminate, laminated structure in Douglas fir, again, and a concrete core, as you can see on the, on the plan and the section. Um, here, on, for this project, um, the wooden structures are protected by a zinc um, cladding. Um, and the wood is uh, either protected outside or inside. Uh, and the, the project is very simple. It's a, a volume with uh, one, um, uh, one single opening on each facade, including uh, the roof. You can see on those pictures, uh, the associative spaces. Uh, using several types of wood, either Douglas fir or uh, pine tree, but also oak tree for the for the floor for the flooring. Here you can see a dancing 
space for um, dancing, dancing groups. Uh, and you can also see uh, the relation between the um, wooden structure and the uh, concrete uh, core that uh, has a very important role for the to, to stock uh, energy um, uh, energy uh, solar energy the second building um, is a market hall so, so and it references um, it's inspired by the, those traditional barns you can see on the on the picture that were once covered with uh, uh, thatched roof, uh, but from the 1950s, uh, the thatch was replaced by galvanized steel sheets, which eventually rusted in the time. Um, so the project is inspired by the archetypal uh, volumetry of the barn, as well as its uh, specific framework. Um, but what I like also about those um, galvanized um, steel sheet that got it, got rusted is also the relation to the landscape. Um, you have to imagine that uh, in the autumn, uh, ferns and beaches on the mountain slopes um, get the, the, the same color. That's a diagram of a traditional uh, barn with, with its plan and its um, uh, framework. Uh, very simple uh, repetition of the same uh, system uh, every meter. Um, uh, it's a non there's, there's no hierarchy in the framework. It's all, always the same repetition with the same um, modular system. And that's the the, the plan, um, the diagram of the market hall. Um, that was inspired by those traditional buildings, traditional barns. Here's a picture of the marketplace in the in the village, in this one one of the most beautiful valleys of our region. So, of course, uh, the two main walls were excavated as if we opened the walls of the traditional farm and inside uh, you discover the woodwork uh, that is directly inspired by the framework of the uh, traditional barns but all the uh, parts of the structure which are um, uh, in link with the uh, with uh, snow for example because it's that, that project is at about 1000 meters high so there's quite a lot of snow in the in that part of um, the Cantal. Um, so here all those um, elements uh, that are in contact with the snow are in metal, um, uh, the same uh, quality than the, the roof. The third project is the, um, here again, in, influenced by, inspired by traditional architecture of the Carcy uh, region, which is in the Departement of the Lot. Um, uh, you can see here a traditional barn, uh, here another traditional house with a, a particular plan, but you can see the very uh, specific um, roofs with uh, which are covered with uh, uh, terracotta um, tiles. Uh, and so the, the project I'm going to talk about now is uh, um, the house of the Coste du Carcy Natural Park, which is uh, located in uh, La Bastide Murat. Um, uh, and it's influenced by so the, uh, traditional architecture, but also oriental inspirations, um, e either Chinese or Japanese with a, two, a double courtyard system. It's as if we had two barns, uh, uh, one against the other, but with two courtyards uh, separating them. Um, and the project is situated at the entrance of the of the village, um, astride uh, an embankment, and is uh, organized around two courtyards, uh, as I said. Uh, and the, hotel, the entire entrance of the village is uh, reclassified uh, to facilitate the pedestrian mobility 
from for all the inhabitants between the center of the village um, and uh, the contemporary extensions. Uh, so you can see this new path that uh, goes under the, the, the building to um, to join uh, the, the town village, uh, the town center, sorry. That's the relation of the main facade uh, facing south and facing also the entrance of, of the village. In this architecture, the water is not um, uh, collected uh, at the roof level, but uh, on the ground. Um, and it's the same in the courtyards. So as he, he has a, uh, obviously a, a very important role in the, for the, um, the quality of, uh, uh, of the climate in, in the buildings, because it can become very hot in that area of France. Uh, so it's also a way to respond to the uh, climate change. Um, and there again, the water is collected on the ground. Uh, so as in such a way, it can st stay longest uh, in the courtyard to um, help um, cool, cool off all the interior spaces um, as soon as you open all the windows that uh, open on, this, uh, on those two, two, two courtyards. The wall insulation is all made of local straw uh, bars. Um, it's another way to uh, um, imagine using uh, resources that are directly um, linked to local um, to the local uh, um, territory. Finally, I'm going to uh, talk about um, a very small project, which is a a house, uh, a very small house for a couple of farmers um, in the Corrèze uh, region, it's a bit further north from where I live, about one hour and a half, uh, um, um, one hour and a half drive. Um, and the project is inspired here uh, by three references by the architecture of uh, the designer Charlotte Perriand, uh, the Auvergne built in beds uh, like that look like cupboards uh, in which you can um, protect yourself from the cold weather, uh, cold uh, temperatures. And the third, um, the third um, influence is um, a Japanese uh, traditional architecture. Um, the house is very different from the other ones, which are all built in, in granite. You can see the house, uh, the, the village here. Uh, I don't know if you see my on, on the on the right. You can see the village far away. What I like, by the way, about this picture is that uh, um, is the changing landscape. You see, on this picture, all the voids have become full over the decades. It means the different shades of green and brown show the difference between uh, hardwood and uh, coniferous uh, forest. All the green is recent forest. Uh, that means the, this farm is the only one uh, of the of this area that still uh, is in use. Otherwise, all the pastures have been transformed into forests. So I was saying that this, yeah, the, the house is very different from the others, which are all built in, in granite and stone, um, and the, which shows a specific place such as, in, in a way, um, the, the farmers can overlook what's happening in the, the farm because they are the only inhabitants here uh, all year round. Some other families come here uh, on vacation, but otherwise, um, in winter time, for example, they are the only ones to live in this uh, remote place. The house, uh, um, Here's the fig figure of the di diagram of the house, um, the plan and a section. And here the masonry is very simple. It's only one uh, wall uh, built in earth between uh, wooden structures and it's uh, only there for inertia uh, to um, uh, 
in such a way that the solar energy uh, can be stocked in the in that uh, war and uh, restitute the the, the, the heat um, after a few hours. Yeah, so of, of course the plan is very different from an ordinary house with uh, you know 12 square meters uh, bedrooms for example or uh, very separate spaces it's like a, a open space uh, and and the bedrooms are sort of cupboards in which you can sleep um, so the bedrooms are like three or four square meters only uh, and some um, that's a picture of the of the house which is uh, what's interesting also is that it's the farmers who built the house so we designed very uh, precise plans that were um, respected by the the, the farmers. Um, so the relation between interior and exterior with the view uh, on the farmland. That's one of the bedrooms or uh, living area. It's very the, the Spain is very, uh, the space is very uh, polyvalent. Another picture of. Uh, the, this central wall in earth uh, that's covered with uh, lime, uh, uh, sort of a stucco, uh, and you can see the, uh, the fireplace that heats the whole the whole house very simply. Um, and at last, um, here's a, um, the building that we um, we uh, designed. Uh, which is um, a sheep fold, um, entirely self-built again by the farmers, uh, and produced uh, with uh, extreme economy of means. Uh, it costs uh, not even 140 euros per square meter. Um, um, and the side uh, greenhouses accommodate different functions depending on the seasons. Um, growing vegetables in the summer, uh, but it also serves for l the lambing, for the birth of the lambs uh, at the end of the winter. A few pictures taken uh, a few days ago in the uh, in that um, uh, farm. That's the greenhouse uh, as it is today with the end of the season of tomatoes and other different vegetables. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. All of us, we wish to be animals now, to live in your last project. May I introduce now Benedetta Taliabue, co-founder of EMBT Barcelona in Spain. Benedetta, Benedetta Taliabue founded the EMBT agency with Henrik Mirales in Barcelona in uh, 1994. EMBT made a name of itself quickly with projects such as the Parliament of Edinburgh and the Santa Caterina market in Barcelona, which were both spectacularly expressive and deeply rooted in the history of the place. After the death of Henrik Mirales, EMBT went on to work on major international projects in China, in Europe, in Hamburg, Greater Paris, Shanghai, Barcelona, Naples, and so on. One might wonder why Benedetta Talia Bue is receiving this Global Award for Sustainable Architecture, given the extent to which the market of XL architecture is driven by aims, city branding, by example, that have nothing to do with improving the state of urban civilization. But there is a thing. Benedetta Talia Bui did never shape EMBT as a predator of international competition, but as a multicultural working environment. Some 40 passionate architects able to embark all projects all together in a train of permanent experimentation. For that, they have method. Cartographies, collage, 
exploration. And they have a headache given by Benedetta, Benedetta to, give ex, to give creative experimentation all the time it needs. These headaches often almost ruin the economics of the agency. But it is thanks to this ethic that EMBT owes the recognition of its singular creativity in the world. On experimentation, EMBT delivers two messages from my point of view. At first, experimentation in architecture also feeds on history. Benedetta and Henrik learned this on the archaeology archaeological digs of the old Santa Caterina market in Barcelona, discovering painted stucco hidden beneath plaster, ceramic, old ceramics, buried beneath rubble. When they crossed archives and plans to understand the continuum of the site metamorphosis, since, the, since this period, EMBT has treated every project site not as a blank page, but as a palimpsest, unfolding it to nourish the exploration of each project. The second message is that architecture is a continuous experimentation with material and structure, that EMBT never delivered a parachuted international architecture is due to its curiosity about material innovation, knowledge, and resource. It is through this that a project takes root in a culture, as in the case of the Spanish pavilion at the Shanghai International Exhibition. Let's remember, no one believed in, no one wanted the wicked basket envelope that Benedetta proposed. We have never done it before. It will not age well. It will cost a fortune, says the client. But then, the Spanish craftsmen arrived. But then, they, oh, they got on wonderfully with the Chinese craftsmen. Together, this team of craftsmen competed in invention to wave this amazing canopy. Benedetta Taliabue quotes a simple sentence by Henrik, Henrik Mirales. When it's unmade, unmade, it shows. And she adds, it is the greatness of all those hands working on a building that makes this building unique. Dear Benedetta, you have your words. Thank you so much, uh, Marie-Hélène. Your words are incredible. And uh, I think uh, I, I feel very honored to be today with such fantastic people in the same prize. I, I loved the presentation. I love the work and the radicality of everybody. So I'm uh, really very, very happy to receive this prize today. Uh, thank you, Jana, also for that. So today about experimentation and uh, about uh, trying always while we do architecture, I thought it would be nice to have uh, the showcase of the Spain Pavilion, which uh, I show here in, with uh, uh, workers like dancers on the structure. So. Uh, Oops, um, it was in Shanghai, a competition that we were absolutely sure not to win because it's Spain and I am Italian. It was also Spain national um, symbol in, uh, in, a, in the exterior and I am coming also from Catalonia, which is a region which is not absolutely uh, identified with that. So we, when we did the competition, we were very light. We were very playful. We could have this sense, we will not win. We do it because we really would like to say something. And I remember in our international team, 
there was a fantastic Japanese architect in love with Penelope Cruz and all the flamenco world. So we let the flamenco world to have a very little space and uh, the building becoming a real flamenco symbol bringing this dynamic of Spain into, into the Shanghai Expo. But also we were very much in love with these traditions which are getting lost and that are nearly the same in China, in Spain and in the rest of the world. So we thought this is a wonderful language, the language of hands which makes tools why don't we try to make a building which is uh, looking like one of these stools, which is uh, really a kind of a enormous handmade uh, material. So we worked on the geometry. We imagined a building which had courtyards and different openings, some interior, some exterior, and then had a fantastic dress around which would be like uh, uh, like this of the, the Miyaki dresses, let's say, uh, looking very mysterious. So you don't know if it's a living being or if it's an inanimate, inanimate being or if it's something uh, appearing uh, that you don't really know what it is. So we tried in our office and we tried to see how do we make this dress made out of wicker and uh, we have many people in the office and we love to uh, to work with hands so all the hands of uh, of uh, the model makers or uh, when we were trying to understand how to make this uh, uh, pieces go together uh, we were really experimenting on the shapes i remember we were talking with, uh, with the artisans here in Spain. And in the same time, we were artisans ourselves trying to uh, reinvent uh, possible cells, possible pieces, which then would become the element to cover the big structure of the Spain pavilion. Then at the end, we arrived to a very special shape it's a shape which is also coming from, uh, from Gaudi. Gaudi had a fantastic experimentation on curves coming from, uh, from uh, straight lines. And, uh, and these curves could go together in order to cover a surface and more than everything, a very complex surface as the one we were planning for the Spanish pavilion that, as I said before, we wanted to be very, very dynamic. So we had here in Spain uh, a lot of experimentation and also investigation with, uh, with the university. We went around and we met most of the fantastic artisans who still exist in, in the territory and work with these materials. The, it's uh, incredibly different, the world of uh, how you can produce with your hands and with these uh, small woods. And uh, in the other hand, we tried to implement that in China. We also wanted to introduce uh, a calligraphy because we really wanted the culture of China to arrive in, into the pavilion and uh, the pavilion to be like a big uh, message of love and uh, ecology and a new type of culture and how the cities would be better in the future, how could it be? So the plan was this, this kind of very organic plan where the masses of people which we were expecting were contributing to this big plan. And then we had this beautiful getting near, you know? It was the first time we were working in China and we had a photographer on the side who was sending us the images in order to discover how was the working world going around in China. And we discovered that it was so similar to the world that we knew. 
so similar to the Spanish world which, uh, of construction, which is uh, many times uh, very inventive and uh, not so strict into the norm norms and normatives. So some of these images are to me absolutely fantastic. This, uh, uh, the power of the builders, the beauty of the builders, the intelligence of the under construction world. And uh, little by little, I think that the, the solution of the building was uh, kind of becoming similar to, to the people on site. And uh, these photos were bringing us this uh, near relationship between the hands that really were building the building and, and, uh, and the people who were designing it, inventing it, uh, giving them the possibility to, to, to really then construct. And we were very impressed by this beauty of the natural material all the time on site, very much used and very inventively used as, as here, the panel becomes a bed. So uh, also we were able to go to the place where at the end, the Chinese artisans taught by the Spanish artisans started to build the more than 8,000 panels that were uh, going on site and uh, that had to be really woven by hands uh, all together so that to be hung on the facade of the Spain pavilion for the International Universal Expo. That was a great new thing for China in 2010. So I, I really love these uh, images because this is really this material which is happening. Of course, you know, this was uh, more difficult than I'm telling you now. Uh, during a lot of moments, uh, the Spanish constructor was coming to me and say, oh, this is not possible. You had this idea of a weaker material of a pavilion, which is like a, 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 a basket, but we will make it metaphorically. And I, we were insisting and saying, no, no, it's not metaphorical, it's real. It is really a wicker hand woven building. And, uh, and as you see, little by little, as a miracle, this could become a reality. The wicker panels could be hung on the facade and uh, could become the kind of a new surface which were taking the space in between the building, the structure, the glass, and the outside world, the sky, the air. So when the first photographs arrived of the pavilion uh, taking uh, its shape, uh, I thought it was uh, photos of an animal. It was like our pet. And uh, we had no idea how the public would react to it. But I think the public also reacted to this wicker building as, as if they were finding, instead of a building, a sort of friend there in the, in the Universal Expo because everybody was kind of uh, identifying with, uh, with this material, with this craft, everybody had uh, a craft piece which was were resembling this, uh, this uh, wicker work. And uh, at the end, this really started to be a very ecologic building, a building which was breathing. Uh, it was uh, making different smells, depending if you had a different type of uh, of climate, uh, rain or wind or sun. It was uh, starting also to change color in relation to if it was very much sun or very humid. And, uh, and you really could feel that when you were in the inside. You really could feel that this was a very alive building. 
And here we have this uh, place with the gigantic baby by the film director Isabel Cochet, who is also a, a friend. And they were commenting, ah, Isabel Cochet made the gigantic building and you made the gigantic basket to make the, the child uh, sleep. So this was the idea. And uh, after that, there were many other projects coming from the desire to go on with uh, a kind of a textile architecture. And in order to do that, for example, here in Paris, we tried with uh, textile fibers, which uh, could resist in the outside. We also experimented this in the Biennale in Venice. But here it was especially uh, for a subway station uh, in, a, in a very difficult place in Clichy Montfermeil, where destruction, social uneasiness was happening. So we tried to invent uh, uh, a way of, uh, of uh, uh, resembling, making the building resembling the, uh, the environment. So here, this market was happening, and on top of this market, in the future, the station should happen. And so we were in, in imagining the station made out of, of these uh, materials, you know, these textile materials, so that, that you have this pergola made of, uh, of panels um, woven, woven with this new technological textile, and, uh, and we went on and on with this because this uh, project, of course, is an infrastructure project. It's taking more than 10 years. And uh, unluckily, here I lost my woven battle because uh, in France, uh, in these stations, at a certain point, uh, experimentation in materials was uh, impossible, was not financed again, and it was not open. So we had to go back to a new material, which is uh, more conventional. It was used before, but the colors, we are deciding about it with, uh, with the people, with the women of the place. And then very quickly, uh, other stations where uh, the wood is fundamental. And uh, I'm learning how wood is a wonderful material and how uh, it is giving the possibility to regenerate. So it's uh, incredible no, to have a new structure in a place like this in Naples, which is very, very hard. Or also in a cult place like uh, this, uh, this um, church in Ferrara, we could in introduce a lot of natural wood, trying to follow these uh, desires that we had at the beginning, you know, to make a very, very light uh, building, which would look a little bit like uh, a balloon arriving on the floor. And uh, this uh, interior in wood is, uh, is really helpful in order to give, uh, to give this feeling uh, that this material is natural, that this space is, uh, is really helping you in the concentration and is really making you feel like at home. So these uh, uh, this, uh, projects are very many experiments that we are doing. We are doing in many scales, sometimes a scale like this one in Milan is also very useful because you can do something in a, in a very little time, uh, accepting uh, existing uh, trees and existing uh, uh, bushes, for example, and live together with it. Or we can experiment in furniture, uh, learning from people who is uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, wood, or also in a big scale like this uh, Lungomare in Rimini, which is a transformation of, uh, of a parking lot in the city, or the transformation of uh, the harbor in Hamburg into a piece of city dedicated to people, or more wood, uh, ceramic and wood, or 
this building, which is very important to us, which is uh, introducing textile architecture in ceramic, and which is one of these buildings who are designed next to hospitals to give to the patients the feeling that you are uh, feeling at home while you are in the hospitals. So these are the, the projects we are developing, some of them. And of course, today I'm at home and uh, I show you behind myself my office. And these are images from my office. So I'm uh, welcoming you here today, but I wait for you uh, to visit us in, uh, in Barcelona, in our office, which is both an office and experimental place called Eric Miralles Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Benedetta. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the five architects, yes, for this, for this amazing lecture, for this Global Award for Sustainable Architecture 2023. I think we could offer to the people the diversity of experimentation today, and they had a diversity which is the aim of this Global Award for Sustainable Architecture. The idea which never changing is not to create a selective academy of the best architects of the world, but maybe to build and to offer to each of you something like a petri box. Let's think that all of us, you are bacteries, living bacteries, entering the petri box to exchange, to nourish the international debate. And may I, do I, may I hope to produce <laughs> a better nourishing for the, for the planet. But the last word will be given by Catherine Chevillot, President of the Cité de l'Architecture, and Yana Revedin, President Founder of the Global Award for Sustainable Architecture. Catherine, please. Uh, thank you, Marie-Hélène, to have uh, uh, distributed the, the words. Um, I would just like to... Uh, uh, express uh, warmest thanks again uh, to our sponsors, uh, general sponsors uh, of the Cité de l'Architecture for many years, the Society Saint-Gobain, and the particular sponsor of this uh, global award, the Gretec Society. Warmest thanks to, to you to have allowed us to manage with this global award uh, this year again. And um, perhaps I didn't say uh, at the beginning that we will have also the great uh, chance, and uh, we are very happy of that, to host a special exhibition conceived and uh, realized by Tian Tian. Uh, upon the Tulo, upon the, this project that uh, she is uh, conducting in Fujian in China. Um, this, uh, this exhibition will open to the public in the Cité de l'Architecture in 17th of November. So, uh, appointment to you and opportunities to come again to the Cité de l'Architecture. Thank you to all of you. Thank you also to the members of the jury. And uh, uh, I hope you appreciated the communication of our award winners. And I let the final word to Jana. Thank you very much, Catherine Chevillot, and to the Cité de l'Architecture. You were a wonderful host, like some so many years from now, also today. Behind me, you don't see them, but they're with me, are the members of my scientific jury, Global Award Scientific Jury, since many, many years, the most trustful and the most generous persons. I'd like to name them. Thank you of cho for choosing this great uh, choice for architecture is experimentation 2023. We had five wonderful lectures and you see the diversity of this award. It is not 
sticking to one subject, but it is opening from one subject to a fan of wide interpretations. Thank you, Denise Insedai of Mimar Sinan University in Istanbul. Thank you, Spela Hudnik, Ljubljana University, Marie-Lene Contal, that you have uh, listen to the new rector of uh, the Ecole Spéciale d'Architecture in Paris, my new university, and Jacopo Galli, my colleague from U of Venice, my alma mater, my old university. Uh, these are the stable members of the scientific jury. Then we have honorary members every year, Christian S, philosopher uh, in Paris, uh, this year, we, for this selection, we had two uh, Global Award uh, laureates that we choose not by the year they were laureated, but by the year by the affinity to the topic. Architecture is experimentation, and these were Omer Selçuk Bas from Istanbul, laureate the year before, and Anupa Makundu from Berlin, and of course India, laureate it by also by a little bit of combination the year before that the topic you remember was the territory threat or opportunity. Of course, every one of the winners defined the territory and the place and the character of sites, an opportunity and not a threat. But sometimes I raise questions to be answered by our laureates. And of course, also member of the jury, Catherine Chevillot, that welcomed us. Thank you again for having us, Catherine, and for organizing this, uh, this technically difficult, but very well managed uh, meeting on Zoom. I might greet uh, our new members of the community. Maybe you don't know yet. We have a new publisher, uh, Architangle from Berlin. Christina Steingeber, founder and CEO, is with us today. We are very happy to have found this new publisher that from next year on, 2024, will publish not only your uh, volume, Architecture is Ar Experimentation, but also the next one, next theme will be Architecture is education. You might wonder how I get to those themes. It is normally in the jury meeting the year before that we see coming up candidates that are most likely in the air of being the, the, the topic to be treated. And then we decide all together with my members of the jury, this might be the topic for next year. So be curious to know the five new laureates for next year. Uh, the ceremony will be held for this time in a new, new, also a new global award dimension in Venice, hosted by the U of uh, University, uh, 19th of April, 2024, at the opening of the Venetian Biennale. So you're all welcome. Your book will be presented, and the book on architecture is Education a double series that we start with. Thank you, Christina Steingraber, for this confidence and from this, for this curiosity. We are working together in this new direction. And I also greet uh, Laurence Pernon, Vice President of Communication from the Company of Saint-Gobain, Saint -Gobain, uh, which is the world, one of the world leaders of sustainable materials and structures. And uh, they will accompany us in the whole production and communication of the prize from now on. We are very, very glad and happy to have you in our back, on our side and with us. So thank you for all this work done by my uh, pro bono uh, team that since many, many years is, is fighting for a new ethics for architecture and the city. And I just give you uh, Again, thinking back, the definition of the Oxford language, uh, the Oxford language uh, volume of the word experimentation, the definition is the action or process of trying out new ideas, methods, or activities. And this is the question they. Yes, the scientific question that I rise every year with giving this theme, should architecture not be 
experimentation. And if and this need is more urgent than ever before, and when we can subscribe this today, even more than a year ago when this theme was created, how can we redefine architects as lifelong explorers, please, as they were at my time of reference, the Bauhaus, the reformatory action towards an architecture for everyone and not just for a single elite in some of our countries, not even in all of the countries of that planet. So how can the architect be militating, being exploring new solutions as we could see in the, all of the five presentations of you of your uh, of this afternoon i'm greeting our students that are looking and following this activity and this movement in europe in all the continents we are connected with many of our 80 by now uh, global award laureates so you have been surely seen and will be seen by many, many of young of the young generation that we trust in and that we hope for. Uh, I shall make a very um, short resume from what you said, because we already have your interviews. We have the book that is being made and you will discover it in very few months. But thank you, Mette Ramska Thompson from the CETA in Copenhagen for what you said today, understand the failures of materials to invent a new architecture that is continuously built, repaired and changed. Dear students, dear PhD students, we have to think about this new architecture that will be changing every moment, changing every day, as Benedetta beautifully told us, by the climate, by the humidity, by the life itself that architecture is, is taking care of. So Mette, thank you for your presentation and for the beautiful photos. Your publication will, your chapter will be a pleasure. And even the Cité de l'Architecture who will produce the expo for, uh, for next year's um, award is, I think, very pleased and happy to have those images. Ronald, my architect colleague and Eric, philosopher friend, I could have been a philosopher also, but became an architect. The RAF practice tells us about vulnerability and all landscape architects, all urban designers, all sociologists, in also the philosophers, of course, they tried to tell us Dear architects, think about the living element that you have to protect and to cover and to assure. What you said today, listen, dear students, the things you see are equally important as the things you don't see. Don't add too much, create a poetry of absence. How beautiful is that. Thank you, Ronald. Thank you, Eric. I believe that we will do many things together, even write together. And this is also the scope of this community. We build together, we teach together, we write together, we militate together. And this is really happening. Dear Tian Tian, I'm honored to be able to call you that way. And normally, Chinese, they love to have their whole name. Dear Xian Tian, you, you, the beauty of your approach is so parallel to my methodology and my theory that it is even surprising myself. And I think it's surprising you also. What you say is systemic solutions need to be Tailor made to the context. Please listen, huh? dear students. It's not parachuting anymore. We need to make tailor made solutions 
for a given context. And what you do, your method is exactly my radical method and everyone who's following both of them might see how, how amazing uh, the similarities are. You map culture and history, infrastructure and economy, environment and nature, together with agriculture, of course, where there is social life and health. And you try to put the whole energy from a negative to a positive. Thank you, Tian Tian. This is a great approach, not only in projects. It's not about the quantity of projects. It's about the, 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 uh, the rightness and the effectiveness of your method. And I'm sure not only in China, this is a, this is a model process that we will all follow closely. And most of all, the young generation in your country and in many other countries that have to recall that, as you say, we need to be to, to tailor made solutions for our context and to take them seriously. Very similar as a, as a theory and as an ethics, Simon Tessou, building less today does not mean resignation. No, building less allows us to develop a different ethics of quality. This is a little bit this different ethics of quality, what I very, very long time used to say when journalists asked me, what is it about your sustainable? And I said, you know, it's very simple. It means to age well. And listen to your five interventions, all of your smaller or larger interventions, they just age well because they're appropriate to their topic, to their problematics, and to the questions as rough you rise. And these are huge questions and they make us think about what does it mean to change an existing element to another? Is it worth it? Would it age well? Would it tell something to people? And Benedetta, Benedetta Tagliabue, who finally arrived between this group of uh, Global Award laureates after many, many years on the long lists. Benedetta Tagliabue speaks about creative experimentation and I quote you, the Spanish pavilion was absolutely not to win. We did not think to win it. So we could be playful. Dear students, dear young architects, please do not think about winning. Think about giving something to humanity. Think about being playful, funny, think to surprise us. And what my master Aldo Rossi said at every end of a correction in school or out of the school. So now you go develop your project, have fun with it. Have fun with it. This is in the end what we try to do. So thank you for all these five beautiful talks. Uh, next year, I give you an idea of five laureates, new colleagues of your community that will uh, show us how this architecture's education can be also joyful, surprising, having fun with the whole thing. The most beautiful profession have, that, on, that is on this planet we have chosen. So let us be honored uh, to do this work. In this year's jury, next year's jury for architecture's education, I thank also my honorable uh, Global Award laureates that was, have been with us yesterday. We know the winners, so be curious. And this was uh, Mette Ramskart, who we heard today, and also Su Tian Tian. I give you the date to see in Venice, April 19th, 2024. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for your time and dear students, Go ahead being curious. Thank you very much.